I don't sleep with my windows open anymore. No matter how hot it gets, that bastard stays closed. It's been this way for a long time. Since I was very young. It's not just a real hit with the ladies during summertime. People usually recommend air conditioners, and I usually go with the prospect when I have company, but... When it's in... I don't sleep well. At all. Because... I can only imagine how easy it would be for anyone to bypass them. There's a single perk of an AC, though. Well, besides the relief from the hot stickiness of the summertime's humidity, and that's the steady hum which stifles the silence. I don't like the silence, you see. There was a time when it brought me an almost zen-like level of peace and tranquility, but now... I find it intrusive. Dangerous. Silence never comes alone. From time to time, I can still hear the chanting from my ear. I can hear them all, wordlessly, and yet with prestigious synchronicity and harmony within me, with one another. Their conjured voices echo out from the woods like the gentle and yet threatening breeze that precedes a violent hailstorm, rhythmic yet senseless. It never went away. And yet, I know they've all moved on or died. I know this all very well. When I was about nine years old, me and my dad lived in this old rented two-family apartment house in a town called Bridgewater in the state of Massachusetts. We lived on the bottom floor. The second floor wasn't used. It was recently vacated by its prior residents. It was a very quiet neighborhood, very suburban, and with plenty of woods. But behind our house, there was a backyard that proceeded into a large forest that spanned for miles out. I used to play in them. My dad and my mother were recently divorced. So there were just the three of us living there. Me, him, and the dog, Cash, who was named after the late country singer Johnny Cash. He was an old Scottish terrier. You know the type, ankle biters, with the really ugly bearded faces. They got him as a pup when I was still in diapers, and he was my lifelong friend. He may have been something of an idiot, but <laughs> at the time, he was all I had. I cried. I cried and cried when Mom tried to take him. In the end, he was left to my father's care for my sake. Me and Cash would spend a lot of time playing in the woods. When you're young, your imagination is a very powerful thing, and the woods had an almost magic quality in terms of supplementation of my imagination. I would play army, build forts, climb trees, one time, me and Cash traveled so far, I actually got lost. We were losing daylight as it was October, and the light was fading at a much faster rate. I began to panic, afraid I'd be trapped out here in the pitch black. As we walked around, frantic for landmarks, anything familiar, that's when I saw it. The clearing with a large rock in the center. It wasn't exactly uncommon to see graffiti and vandalism in the woods, a public forest is known quite well for trees with messages carved into them. Names, swastikas, Brad and Jen forever, and a nice cute heart. Stuff like that. Not to mention the pseudo-gang names spray-painted on rocks. That was the impression I got of this place. A hangout for older kids. But something wasn't right. Me being only nine, my mind wasn't exactly capable of comprehending the connotation of symbols and other things. And yet... There was something really off about these images. I've never seen anything like them before. The surrounding trees had crudely shaped images of what appeared to be a goat-man hybrid. Like a stick figure with an unnecessarily detailed goat's head. Imposed over where you'd expect to see a very basic stick figure face. These images were drawn over and over 
and over again. All over the trees that surrounded the clearing, almost obsessively so. Not just the basic human height level, but all up the trees as if whoever carved them had used a ladder. The rock itself had red markings all over it. Letters that I had never seen before. Underneath, though, was written in black spray paint a message I actually could read. It said, Behold the wisdom of the horn. And below that, there were five painted lines. They were all the same height except for the two outer lines. They were twice the height and spiraled outwards at the top. What really scared me about this place, though, were the dolls. They were hanging from the branches around the clearing. They appeared to be woven out of sticks, and poorly so. Taking a closer look, I realized what was so scary about them. While the stick dolls were clearly constructed with the grace of shitty arts and craft students, the heads of them were dry and clean skulls of animals. I didn't know what of, but they were bleached white, dry and clean, and their hollow sockets. I can't explain it effectively without sounding insane, but there was something sentient about them. Watchful and pleading. I could feel their eyes on me, though they had none to watch with. I felt fear. Not my own fear, mind you, but something... An aura of emotion that made absolutely no sense. Have you ever been at an underage drinking party that got crashed by the police? It was that kind of fear. The fear that comes synonymously with trouble. I can't explain why I did, but I reached up and touched one. Maybe it was... The a child's general inquisitive nature that compelled me. Maybe it was a fascination or intense desire to quell my fear and convince myself that they were just dolls and not the watchful spirits I would eventually come to believe they were. When I touched it, the skull fell off. The doll unwove itself. Only a piece of it remained and attached to the rawhide rope that it was suspended from. The skull cracked when it hit the ground. And when it happened, there was there was a certainty that quelled inside of me, as naive as a nine-year-old could be. There was also a certainty that remained with me to this day. I don't belong here. Cash immediately started barking when the doll fell, and it startled me so effectively that I let out a scream. I looked up. The sky was glowing red with a darkness not too far behind. The sun was going down, and I had to get out of here. Cash was staring at me, black eyes wide open and tail wagging violently. He was barking at me insistently. He began to growl at something, maybe air, maybe ghosts. When I approached him, he turned and ran. Cash was my only companion in this unnatural place. I would have been damned if I was going to let him betray me to solitude here, so I gave chase. I ran for my life. The last thing I saw before I chased Cash was something that really messed with me. All the other dolls that were hanging when I first arrived, they were dangling, some even spinning lazily in the breeze. And yet, as I ran after Cash, I saw every single doll on the site were completely stationary, staring and facing me directly. I was dismissive of this detail as I was more afraid of being alone. I never let Cash out of my sight. He led me straight home. I never loved my dog more than when I realized what he had done for me. Dogs are never lost. They always know the way. Before I went to bed, I told my dad what I saw. He laughed it off and told me it was just teenagers being punks, and that I should just let it go. I found it comforting. 
I was almost willing to let it go. I even fell asleep without any trouble. That night was when I heard it for the first time. The noise that haunt me to this very day. I woke up and I could hear noise coming through my window. I got up and looked out to listen closer. That's when I realized it was chanting. Voices, dozens maybe, they were coming from in the woods. I could hear them loudly and rhythmically. I didn't know what they were saying, but I could tell it was ceremonious, like a hymn that you hear people sing in churches, except it felt dark, violent even. I immediately thought about the clearing of the rock, the dolls, the fear. I knew in my bones that the chanting was coming from there. What scared me the most was that it wasn't far. It wasn't far at all. The chanting went on for hours. I just lied there in bed, wide-eyed, with fear listening to it, praying that it stop. It wouldn't, though. It went on until four in the morning, when the early birds began to wake up. I stopped playing in the woods. My dad noticed the behavior immediately and asked if I was alright. I told him about the chanting and again he shrugged his shoulders and said it was probably teenagers drinking beers, having a party. I asked them why they drink beer and chant the same sound for five hours. He told me they weren't chanting, that I imagined it, and that I should close the window from now on. I probably should have listened to him. But I didn't. Curiosity got the better of me. The next night, the chanting began again at exactly 11 o'clock. It seemed louder than before. I couldn't sleep hearing it, but I couldn't bring myself to close the window. I don't know why I thought this way, probably because I was just a child. I dim-wittedly thought at the time that if I closed my window, I wouldn't be able to hear them coming if they decided to break into the house. The logic is flawed, I know. But they would still be chanting as they emerged from the woods and crossed my yard and not be nice and quiet about it, but that's how I thought back then. That's why I couldn't close the window, because I had to know if they were coming. This went on for several days, every night from 11 to 4 exactly on the dot. Sometimes I could see in the woods, way, way, way out there, a faint glow, like the light of a fire, but it was so faint and far, but it was so faint and far in between that I didn't know whether to acknowledge or dismiss it as a trick of my own eyes. Other times. I would successfully fall asleep due to exhaustion, only to wake up several hours later in panic, still able to hear it. I asked Dad if Cash could sleep in my room on the third night, and he said it'd be fine. It felt better knowing that I had the dog to keep me company while I'd be able to hear the noise. And better yet, if I could hear them coming, and then be a dog about it, and start barking out of the window at them. I anticipated a good night's sleep, and even felt silly for not thinking about this solution earlier, I fell asleep at eight, with Cash sleeping at the foot of my bed. I woke up at a quarter past eleven to Cash barking. He was on his two hind legs, tail wagging spastically, and he was barking out the window, ears pointed up, barking, growling, howling out the window. I immediately got out of bed and looked 
out the window towards the woods. Nothing. Nothing at all. Cash was very agitated, growling and looking at me, then back out the window and barking. The chanting was still going on, same as the last couple of days. I remember feeling uncomfortable that Cash was barking at the noise, that if he was in danger of getting their attention, I tried to calm him down. That's when my dad came in. He stumbled in groggily and picked up the dog and turned to walk out the door with him, mumbling about him shutting the hell up. I called his name, but he was so asleep. He was practically dead on his feet. I screamed at him, Dad, the woods! That got his attention. He turned around and walked up to me, looked out the window, and then back at me. This again, he mumbled. Look, boy, it's just your imagination. No, listen! That's what Cash was going crazy about. There are people singing in the woods. Just listen! He looked carefully out the window. Cash was growling in his arms as his head turned out the window. I listened, too. There was nothing. No sound. Total silence. I couldn't believe it. Could this have been a coincidence? My dad told me to go to sleep and left the room, mumbling insults at Cash. The silence chilled me far more than the chanting ever did. At least when they were singing their malicious hymns, there was at least a sense of distance between them and me. But now, I know they're out there. But I don't know where. I had no bearings whatsoever. What was even worse, what wrought unexpected terror upon me, was that there was no nighttime ambience in those woods, no crickets. Evenings brought them out in droves this time of year, and even when they were chanting, I could still hear them, but now... Now it was quieter than a bone-chilling winter night. Pure silence. How long did I stare out the window at those woods across my backyard? I had no idea, but when I woke up the next day, I was still sitting on the chair I planted right by it. And that morning over breakfast, I insisted that there really was chanting out there, but my dad wasn't hearing any of it. He put his foot down and told me that he won't hear any more of this, that I needed to grow up and take responsibility and stop being so afraid all the time. You know, typical tough guy dad shit. I didn't even bother to bring up the lack of crickets, knowing full well that he'd have made up an explanation for that as well, so I kept quiet and ate my breakfast. Later that day, I was waiting for my mom to pick me up at the end of my dad's driveway to bring me to my grandma's house where she was currently living. It was Friday, and my mom had me on weekends. As I was waiting, a large black pickup truck passed by the house very slowly. It came to a stop right in front of me. There were two men in the truck, older, about my dad's age. At first, I thought maybe they were friends of his, but this thought didn't last. The driver rolled down his window and looked at me. He was bald and was wearing abnormally slim sunglasses. He was smoking a thin cigar, a cigarillo. I remember the strong smell of it. He looked at me, as if he was sizing me up, investigating for a moment. Until finally he smiled at me, reached over, and hit his friend on the shoulder and pointed me out to him. He too was a bald man wearing the same sunglasses. They said something to each other and then the driver looked back at me with a terrible smile. And drove away, waving slowly at me as he did so. They passed me by three more times before my mom finally picked me up. I didn't give those two any thought, 
and I just took comfort in the thought that I'd be sleeping somewhere else for the next couple of nights. The weekend went by without a hitch, and sleeping over at my grandma's house was such a relief. When I told her and mom about the voices in the woods, they just looked at each other and told me to tell my dad about it. But frustrated, I argued that I did, but it was pointless. She too used the, it's just her imagination crap, same as dad. Not once during the whole experience did the mo- not once during the whole experience did the memory leave my mind of the two men in the truck or the distant chanting. Soon enough, I would have to return. Sunday night came along, and I was dropped back off in my dad's house, where I would spend the whole day dreading the inevitable nightfall, dreading the answer of whether or not I would hear the chanting in the woods hear the strange people sing their dark song in unison. I begged my dad to let me keep Cash in the room with me tonight. But he said no, leaving me to face what happened next, alone. So, come bedtime. I was sitting on my chair by the window, staring into the darkness until the hour came. I stayed up until eleven expecting to hear it, but what I got was silence. No singing. No crickets either, just pure silence. I couldn't tell if I was relieved or terrified. Maybe they all moved on. Maybe they went somewhere else to play their creepy games. It took some self-convincing, but I managed to calm myself to such a state of mind where I could actually go to sleep, knowing that I was safe. Reluctantly, I crawled into my bed and closed my eyes. I woke up to the most bone-chilling, fucked-up thing I could have ever seen. It was surreal, the fucking image of it, every time I sleep. My brain immediately surged itself into full function, beyond consciousness and straight up into full-fledged fight-or-flight mode as cold, rough hands forced its way over my mouth and shoved my face into my own mattress. I felt a body much larger than mine bearing down on me. I felt a jagged kneecap ram itself directly into my stomach as I was then pulled out of my bed and wrestled into a standing position, the cold hand still holding my mouth shut. Another hand wedged itself behind my back and pulled me upwards until the pain became so unbearable I thought my arm was going to come off. Shh, a voice whispered in my ear. His breath was ice cold. Yes, said another voice across the room. My eyes were well adjusted to the darkness as it was, and I could see, through the moonlight shining into my open window, a man wearing a horrible, horrible mask. I thought that he had the head of a goat, but I knew better. The goat stared with lifeless marbles where its eyes should have been. Its head was a mask made out of the severed head of a goat or a ram, not properly stuffed and half rotten. Its horns curled into spirals jutting out of its head and random patches of fur were missing, simply to show raw blistered skin. I tried to scream but the hand of my mouth tightened its grip, my arm behind my back pulled to near breaking points. Scream, and we will kill you, the voice whispered into my ear. My eyes couldn't, no, wouldn't, break away from the horrible person wearing the severed goat's head as a mask. He was shirtless, wearing a necklace of what appeared to be bones. He was horribly emaciated, and there were markings all up and down his torso. In his right hand, he held a knife about the size of my forearm. It's... Its build wasn't like any knife I'd ever seen. It took a step closer to me and pressed it against my throat. The steel was bitterly cold, and the tip of the blade was sharper than anything I'd ever felt. It would have taken less than four ounces of pressure to open my throat. And I knew it. I couldn't cry. I couldn't even breathe. In its other hand, it held a basic candle. Tomorrow, the thing said, 
his voice muffled by the lifeless dead goat mask. You will exit your house at midnight. You will light this candle. You will place it on the ground in the center of your yard. And you will sit behind it. Legs crossed, right foot on top of your left knee, and vice versa. If you don't do this, the voice whispered into my ear, the blood of your loved ones will be on your hands. The goat man quickly retreated the blade from my neck. I don't remember what happened next. I remember waking up in my bed, panting and crying. My dad came in to see what was wrong with me, and when I told him, he told me that it was just a nightmare. At this point, he sat down at the end of my bed. He looked very wry, like he didn't want to say what he was about to say. He rubbed his eyes with his fists, wearily explained to me that this was all just me stressing out over the divorce, that maybe we should look into talking to a therapist about these voices and hallucinations I've been having. I remember feeling so betrayed, so alone by the unfairness of that. I argued with him that everything I was seeing and, and hearing was true, but it was too late. He and mom talked it out, my behavior, my claims. They think I was losing my shit over the divorce. Their minds were made up. Nothing I was going to say would have convinced them otherwise. And, of course, in hindsight, it only made perfect sense. Who would believe a nine-year-old when they say that they... They hear voices. <laughs> I was silent the whole day. Cash sat with me in my room, and I wasted the day playing video games. I didn't speak to my old man once. He looked just as defeated as I did. He spent most of his time on the phone. It wasn't until later that day I found myself recalling what the goat thing said to me before everything went dark. That I had to light a candle at midnight, but when I woke up that morning, there was nothing in my room. There was a sudden sense of hope, because when I searched around my room trying to find his candle, it was nowhere to be found. Never, even to this day, have I searched so hard for something only to be frantically pleased by the end results. It was gone. Have I been... Have I been alleviated from the duties imposed on me by these strangers? The relief was unbearable, like I was... Severed from a horrible burden. Even the thought of being forced to see a shrink didn't seem so harsh compared to the prospect that maybe these attackers really were just a bad dream. A severely realistic dream, mind you, but a bad dream nevertheless. Maybe... Maybe the whole situation really was over. Maybe these horrible people did move on. And maybe the goat man was simply a mental projection of my own imaginative expectation towards whatever it was of those unnatural proceedings just beyond my sight were. You know... Speculation. Nightfall came, and for the first time in a week... I felt no fear at the prospect of it. It felt good, like things were going back to normal. But I was wrong. I was so wrong. When I placed my head on my pillow, eyes already closing, consciousness already drifting away, I felt a lump under my pillow. Curiously, I reached down there and I felt something. Something long and smooth. I pulled out a candle. A tall, thin, wax candle with a nice long wick. It was red, just like the one that the goat man was holding. My heart sank. My mouth went dry. Tears ran down my cheeks. And in that moment... I relived the entirety of last night, all over, down to the very last detail, where the guy holding me whispered in my ear how the blood of my loved ones would be on my hands, and suddenly, I was back in hell.
I was back in the realm of terror. How did they get the candle under my pillow? Had I overlooked it this whole time? I laid in bed until midnight. I didn't dare close my eyes for fear of being held at knife point again, for fear of coming face to face with that horrible goat creature. The night was silent. No crickets, no birds, nothing. Dead silence. I could see that it had turned 12.01. The memory of the goat mask in my mind uttering its instructions to me over and over again. Go outside, light the candle, sit behind it, do it or the blood of my loved ones would be on my hands. At the time, I didn't know what it meant to have blood on your hands. The following day, I would learn exactly what it meant. Around ten minutes in, I mustered up the courage to walk over to my window and look out of it. What I saw choked me on the spot. Side by side at the entrance of the woods, I saw men, shadowed by the night, standing side by side. There must have been twelve of them. None of them were saying anything. They were all dead silent, and I could, I could feel their eyes on me. It was just as strong as when I felt the eyes of the dolls on me back at their sight. In a way, they felt like the same presence, the same intelligence. I couldn't, I can't explain. And then I saw him. The goat man. Or rather, the silhouette of him standing in the center of the figures. He was still, still a stone, but I could make out that face shape, the jutting horns. I could make it all out. I chickened out. I couldn't go out there. I couldn't. I just couldn't. I hid in my bed, blankets over my head, and I shut my eyes tight, crying all night. I didn't fall asleep until I heard the early morning birds. I was awake at 11.30. Shortly after breakfast... I heard my dad shouting in the front yard. I went out to check and see what was happening, what it was that had made him so upset. And as I went out the front door, I could hear him more clearly. I could hear pain in his voice, a knot formed in my throat, and a harrowing sensation crawled across my skin. I wasn't ready to learn about the events that transpired, and that was truly the scariest part, the moment before actualization. These people have mentioned blood on my hands, and I didn't know what it meant. But I had a very vague idea that it meant my family getting hurt. And I thought they got my dad. When I got to him, I saw he was on his knees, crying. Cash was killed, hit by a car. There he lay, goofy pointed ears, his absurdly silly dog beard, black starry eyes, and a hanging tongue, stationary forever. I saw that his center torso had been collapsed and I could see openings in his rear side his ribs jutting out his entrails. Son! My dad cried out as he turned to hug me. It's okay! He quickly led me back inside the house, away from Cash's lifeless body, away from my best friend, dead and mutilated on the side of the road. The last thing I remember seeing as I was brought into the house was a large pickup truck driving away. Slowly. I saw the same two bald men, as old as dad, staring at me through the oddly slim sunglasses. And I saw blood on their front right tire. 
Cash's death was my fault. As I said it out loud, my dad held me tight and said with stone-cold certainty that it wasn't my fault, that sometimes these things happen. He told me exactly what you would expect a father to tell a kid when their pet is killed in a random and seemingly pointless accident. But I knew better. These people in the woods killed Cash, and it was all because I didn't do what they said. It was because I was a coward. His blood was on my hands, just as they said it would be. When I went to my room to cry, I saw outside my window a man in the center of my backyard. A man with no shirt on. A man wearing a mask made out of a severed goat's head, hollowed out on the inside. In the daylight, it was far more disturbing to see because I could almost smell the lack of sanity it had to have exerted. I could see that it was surrounded by flies, but even worse than that, I saw a note that it was holding up, a piece of paper with a single word written across it. Midnight. I couldn't handle it. I ran outside to chase him down, but when I got outside, it was gone. My hate and anger somehow suppressed my guilt and sadness because I ran far into the woods before realizing that this time, if I got lost, I wouldn't have cash to lead me back to the house. I would be alone. No, I would have whatever was in here with me. I could feel eyes in here. I could feel eyes everywhere. Every move was being watched. From the autumn canopy to the bushes just yards away, I knew I was surrounded in here, and as my senses came more clear from the adrenaline-fueled rage I was experiencing, I realized it was getting stronger by the minute. Then, I noticed the smell. The stench. At the time, I thought I smelled like... At the time, I thought it smelled like bad milk or bologna left out in the refrigerator for too long. It was strong, too strong. My eyes began to water, and I could feel my stomach beginning to turn. How could a smell be so powerful to endure? Then it occurred to me that they killed my best friend. There was only one more life they could take. That. The presence became stronger. I could hear whispers in the wind. The smell grew more powerful with every breath. Any second, I was certain I would be overwhelmed by God knows what. I realized that if I didn't do what they demanded of me, I would be taken here. And now, what could I have done? I shook my head. I began to cry. Okay, I'll do it. The relief was instantaneous. The woods became brighter, the smell gone, the feeling of being watched replaced by what could only be described as serene. The woods went from a den of unspeakable terror to a place of... Well, it was just the woods again. Just as it always was. I came back home and helped my dad dig Cash's grave. We said our goodbyes and buried him. He made up a cute dog bone shaped tombstone out of leftover wood from his old workshop. And that was that. My mom came over that day and we all went out to dinner. The food was the best I'd ever had. We gave Cash a little toast. And that was that. In the back of my mind. Midnight. I spent another silent night, staring at my clock, watching the numbers transform into the next 
every 60 seconds. The wait was agonizing. Each passing minute was like a minute removed from my life. That night, I was certain that I was going to die, and I was trapped. They would have killed my parents if I tried anything. Killing Cash made that entirely too clear for me. 11.55, 11.56, 11.57, I looked out the window. There they all were. Side by side, shadows of people and the goat man in the center. Their eyes were on me. I looked at the clock. Midnight. I looked back out the window. They were all gone. They knew. They knew I was going to come out tonight. They killed my dog. And then threatened to kill me on the spot after I followed them into the woods. They knew I was broken. My spirits shattered. And that I was more afraid of what would happen if I didn't come out over... What would happen if I did? I grabbed the candle and walked into my backyard. The darkness was thick, thicker than usual, and the smell. Sour milk, spoiled lunch meat, blood, rot, decay, shit, puke, bile, death. My skin began to crawl, and a shiver overtook, and a shiver took me over. Breathing became difficult. I could scarcely make out the forest before me. It wasn't just an entrance or a boundary. It was a living, breathing thing, and it was anticipating my every move. As I took a step into my yard, a jolt of terror shot through me as I passed through the motion sensors and activated the backyard light. There was a relief in the light. Safety, at least for a while anyway. I used my father's lighter to spark up the candle. I planted it into a cold, dewy grass and sat down nice and slowly, ready to cross my legs. I never sat in the full position that I was instructed to because as I was in the process of sitting down, I saw it. Two green eyes. Have you ever shined a light directly on an animal's face, way off in the distance in the dead of night, at a distance where it was too far away to make out what it looks like, but far enough for the eyes to not catch and reflect the light? This is exactly what I saw, except it seemed to be high above the ground, higher than a coyote's height, and higher even than a human's height. It appeared to be pacing back and forth in the woods. I could hear the leaves shuffling with each step that it was taking, constantly coming in and out of existence due to the unseen trees eclipsing those glowing shards of light. Those glaring eyes. They must have been reflecting off the backyard light. I could hear it breathing. It sounded painful to me, the air coming out in short, sporadic breaths. And when it did... I felt the huffs of frozen air rank with that rotten stench go right through me. I don't remember how long it paced like this, never leaving the outskirts of the woods, never breaking eye contact with me. Every now and then it would stop and lower closer to the ground until its eyes were level with mine. It would remain in this position, like a cat low to the ground, prepping to pounce its prey. It would only stay in this position for ten seconds at a time before it would rise back up and pace more. After it did this several times, I realized something was stopping it. The light. I was dumbstruck, frozen in place. My throat was so tight, the air was barely getting in me, barely getting out of me. There was a powerful sense etched within my soul that any sudden movement would send this thing, this unspeakable thing, into a frenzy. Light or no light. I didn't know if it was going to outright kill me here in the backyard, or if it was going to drag me into the woods and eat me alive there. 
I didn't know what the relationship was between this and the psychopath that ordered me out of here. What I did know was that with each moment, was that, was that with each moment that it wasn't getting me, it was getting madder. I couldn't let it get me. I couldn't let it take me away. Theoretically, I was safe in the light, except the thing was that the motion sensor light ran on a timer. I knew this timer would run out soon. And when it did, the light would go, and nothing would stop it from getting me. With all my courage, all my willpower, I forced myself to stand up, letting out a hoarse breath. The eyes immediately stopped moving when it saw me stand. I couldn't tell you for certain, but... I was almost positive they narrowed. The prospect of me escaping infuriated it to such a level that it began to stalk towards me. I could tell it was moving forward threateningly, showing a willingness to brave the light. I took a step back, and when I did, it took a swift step forward. I could almost see its shape. Tall, thin, bony. Too dark to distinguish any specific features except both. It had horns. Large, curled, spiral-like horns. Or at least it looked like it did. I don't remember running back to the house. I don't remember making it inside. I don't remember anything after the point where the light shut off. It was sudden, as if death caught me. The timer was up. The light shut down and enveloped me in darkness. And I recall hearing it scream. It sounded like a child denied its toy or... Is that me? When the light died, I fucking ran. When it was hours later, it was hours later when I came to. My dad was holding me. Mom was there too. I was crying. Later they would tell me that I was screaming, don't let it get me, over and over again, don't let it get me. I don't remember myself. I never saw the creature again. I never saw the man with the goat mask again. The two men in the pickup truck, I never saw them again either. That day forward, I always slept with the window shut. The next day, my dad and mom took me outside to explain that nothing had happened. We saw displaced grass mixed with mud. We even saw gore marks on the trees. I thought this would be evidence enough to plead my case, but it didn't. My dad immediately laughed at me, telling me he figured the whole thing out. I had an encounter with a deer. Those markings in the trees were from antlers, and it charged me because it felt threatened. This was certainly a convincing explanation that... I fucking wish to God that it was true. But I knew otherwise. Several weeks later, I heard that there was a missing person search that took place in those woods. But I myself hadn't seen nor heard anything at the time. My dad and my therapist insisted that this knowledge would only enable my tendencies as a schizophrenic. So they stopped me from looking into it. Yeah, I was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia disorder. They said I got it through my inability to cope with the divorce. They told me I had retracted into a delusion because I felt responsible for the family's collapse and that my youthful, underdeveloped mind couldn't process the guilt properly. That these cultists and their beast were just agents of my personal symbolism. Something like that. For a while, I believed everything they told me. The lies felt safe. The lies were comfortable. Several years later, they would tell me that I would make a full recovery. It was an easy process since I never had any other encounters. At that point in time, I was so angry. I just told them what they wanted to hear. When I became old enough, I severed all ties with my parents. I moved out of the state. 
Once I was on my own, I looked into the town archives and researched as much information as I could about that era when I was nine. The missing persons report, the manhunt in those woods lasted several days, and, and all they found was one man. He was torn apart, his limbs removed, his organs missing. They found he was wearing a peculiar mask, the head of a ram, but its innards were carefully carved and hollowed to fit out a human's head. When they removed the helmet, they found that he had died with an expression of absolute horror. I took pleasure in that. I would like to believe that these men were cultists. That they were attempting to appease some unseen, unnamed god. A god that absolutely should not have existed. A god that had no right to walk among men. And that during their attempt to appease it, I had botched the ritual by breaking an important piece of the process, the doll, and in their attempt to salvage it, they forced me into offering myself up as a sacrifice to it, but its failure to do whatever it was going to do to me that night destroyed the whole operation. I would prefer to believe that in the name of vengeance, this angry thing turned on its worshippers, killing them all, dragging them all back to wherever it came from. It's the only thing that makes sense to me. There's just one thing I still can't figure out. And that's... Why is it... That no matter where I go... When I'm alone... In quiet places in the dead of night... Why can I still hear them? Chanting that unholy sermon that I heard so long ago in the woods when I was nine.